Say what? It sounds like there's an eBay model There probably could be, but yeah, I think we, we've all had our experiences with eBay models and how they can, that can treat uh, networks. We do, have, we do have some favorites, we'll say. And I take that question with the camera and kind of offline. Yeah. And it's a, it's a company that we're developing actually a strategic partnership for, for other things. But um, and that's they what have they, a really I'm a big solution. I'm a big proponent of actually a third-party EPC, and I'm sure some of our, my buy-sell colleagues will probably kick me for it. I want to sell you hardware. That works. The EPC is kind of a side thing for me, all right? But I want an EPC that's going to work, and as an operator, putting myself back in your chair, I want an EPC that will work with anybody and doesn't care who the hardware vendor is. And that's who that I recommend. Because, you know, as much as I'd love to sell you only buy-sells, I know you're going to play around with something else. Like, how many people have Ubiquities play with Mimosa, and how many people have had Mimosa play with Ubiquity? Anyone want to give you a quick answer show there? Just about everybody. <laughs> like, we know we're always looking for the cool, new, shiny toy that's going to give the customer what they want. And our EPC, for some of all the feature sets that it really needs to deliver, isn't there yet. I'm not going to lie to you and say that it is. But getting back to, you know, I can, I can literally sidetrack on a million reasons why you want your own EPC, but... I really want to emphasize this, and I cannot say it enough. PCI planning, treat it as if it's the, the most important part of your network, because it is. As you start building your network and your LTE network, you're going to start running into, all right, I just built a metro. Now I need to put some small cells in, because I just filled up all the capacity on these sites. So let's offload with small cells. So your PCI planning is really going to take into account the, the importance uh, of your network, as well as, obviously, frequency planning. Yes, sir, you got a lot of questions. I like it. So we'll cover small cell later, um, just before the roadmap, because it's, a, it's actually the majority part of the business for us globally. And I think it's a concept that becomes extremely relevant to each and every one of you very soon. So uh, we'll cover small cell in detail yeah. here today. Small cell is something to be really excited about. They really are. That's really what I want to focus We do some on. really yeah. interesting small cell stuff. I mean, the, you know, you're seeing all the carriers, and I'll speak just quickly to small cell on that. So you're seeing everybody, they're bringing their devices, the, the base stations, closer to the customers. And that's for reason. That's for capacity. You know, even in Maine, where I am, I've seen uh, five rooftop sites that do not carry a single drop of voice. They're data only. Very data-hungry world. Our, our small cell business globally is so hot that it, in Mobile Wireless Congress in Barcelona, SK Telecom, which is Korea's biggest, China Mobile, China Unicom, Intel, and Qualcomm all had it in their booth, our small cell. And I'll explain some of that stuff later. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. Definitely uh, stay awake for Patrick's part again. All right, has anybody got any more questions on PCI planning? Please ask it. It's a great time. Yes, sir. Uh, what, oh, hang on a second. I've got to follow the procedure here. I'm going to get yelled at. I'm just gung-ho. Yeah, so I'm just curious, where do you go with site four, five, six? Does your SSS, how, how high does your PCI number go? Your PCI never goes higher than zero, one, or two. Oh, excuse me, the PSS. Your PCI goes all the way up to 504 is the maximum configuration. So the next question would be, if I was you, what do you do once you get to 505? You do have to reuse PCIs. There's no question about that. You just got to be careful where the hell you're reusing them. You, know, you, can, you can start reusing them right away. You know, but I would say always plan your site like it's going to have six on it. Because then you, generally speaking, you're probably not going to get into a situation where you're going to get yourself in a pickle trying to you know, find PCI. So I would use that very first example for site one. I would copy it again for site two. And you can see how I'm incrementing the numbers. Zero, one, two, all the SSSs are one. Zero, one, two for the second set of sectors are two. So when you get to your third site, it would be 012, all your SSSs are three, then four, and so on. Eventually, it took me a while to get this concept in my head. Like, I got to explain to me probably by five or six PCI gurus that I have a lot of respect for, and I was just like, boom, could not figure it out for the life of me until I, I really had to get some visual representation behind it to validate what they're trying to explain to me. Yes, sir. Is the PCI... Or number is I'm assuming if we're in like say you're 50 miles from one tower to another tower yep that's not going to make the problem or is the interference issue in the cloud no the interference is physical it's, it's physical it's, it's, it's physical it's, okay. it's not a cloud interference at all 
Um, however, 15 miles is not a realm of possibility. We've all probably done some pretty long microwaves. My personal best is 37 miles. Um, but uh, with that said, uh, that doesn't mean that the signal is not going to keep going. So you can still hear it. So make sure your RF planning, which is kind of what we're covering, is tuned for the market you want. Please stop pointing your antennas at the horizon. <laughs> Uh, which kind of goes on my next point. Antenna choice is very important. Um, very, very important. And I think somebody made a comment on Facebook on the buy sell page. I don't think I know they did. And, and I wanted to give like three likes to it. Cheap antennas versus good antennas are a difference. I don't care what the specification sheet says. There is a huge difference. All right. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of Ubiquity. Their antennas suck. Every one of them. However, I do like the new HD 90s, actually. They're actually not that bad. All right. LTE, three 120s. Who's, anybody got this set up now? You? There's one. All right. Do you have any problems? Yeah, you're lucky. 310s? You running 310s? Okay, you're good. Yeah. Don't try to use a, free, a reuse situation on three 120s. You're going to have a headache. It's, it's just, you see... You just look at the, the coverage overlap there. It's huge. That's a huge overlap. All right? And that's actually a pretty, pretty lazy representation of it, actually. Those things cover like 180 degrees. They're, they're pretty, pretty ruthless. I would prefer you do this. If you're going to get away with just doing three, try 90s. And I know you're looking at that gap out there. It's really, you know, these patterns are never perfect. Ever. They look good on paper. We've all seen that. We've all seen you point an antenna at zero and you've been directly behind it and it works magically for a mile with, with crappy antennas. So that is a good example of something I would support. I wouldn't encourage. That's more something I, uh, excuse me, don't do that either. 490s, too much overlap. 465s is something I would encourage. You can do an AB, AB scenario. You'll get 20 megahertz channels out of your block. Uh, preferably if your frequency planning is correct. Uh, you'll maximize your capacity and coverage pretty well uh, with a four sector setup. Uh, and overall, you're going to get higher gain out of using a 65 versus a 90, so you get better penetration. Yes, sir. Oh, hang on. I mean, we, we, you got yelled at once, so you got one freebie. Right. Uh, in uh, band 41, are you going to support ICIC so I can use frequency reuse Absolutely. once with this? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a band 41. Uh, I'm very excited about Band 41. I was going to say something way more inappropriate, but I love Band 41. Any idea when you'll have ICIC support those? We'll talk about that shortly in the roadmap today. But yes, ICIC is important, but I'll talk about it briefly. So don't get too excited about ICIC. There is always a cost to having something cool and new. With ICIC, you lose a little downlink because it has to take one of the frames for the, uh, the downlink frames and replace that with something to tell it what the hell the ICIC is. So you're replacing a downlink frame with an ICIC frame. That's the easiest way to explain that. There's a way more complicated technical reason, but that's the quick way. This is my personal favorite. This is what I chose to do uh, on most of my sites in Maine. Is It's very expensive. I contracted all my tower labor because it was American Tower. I didn't want to do the whole gamut and, and, uh, as far as insurance and tests and all that other nonsense. The comm train was you know, long enough. Um, this is my personal favorite from a construction standpoint because I am maximizing my coverage right away. I am maximizing my capacity right away, and it's built for growth. It, obviously, this doesn't work, and you know if you're only wor working to serve 20 people, you know 30 people, whatever that model may suit. This is obviously more of a metro type design, but this is what I did in most of the state of Maine when I built that. I only did two four sector sites; the rest were six sector. I went in guns blazing. And Alpha's coming in later, and they're going to share, um, they have an interesting new design, actually, which is kind of a, a three-sector single-mount arrangement, and each sector is actually two 33s. Yeah. So uh, really interesting. Yeah, so these are 45 way. degrees. I actually, if you, can get, if you can find them, they're hard to find at CBRS, but we're working with antenna companies now to make them, is really 30 to 33-degree uh, antennas. Now, the trade-off is, obviously, you tighten up the beam width, you have less overlap, but obviously, every time we sneak down that, uh, that coverage pattern, we do increase the DBI gain. So you're really trying to, you know, you really want to make sure you're maximizing 
your MCS levels. So getting the most gains to your customers you possibly can makes a big difference in those MCS, keeps your cell capacity up, and your air utilization low. You might just yeah. leave your hand up. We just yeah. keep it right up on the wall. This is using the model that, you know, north and south is on the same frequency and, you know, northeast and you, all your panels that are 180 out are on the same frequency? That's right. ABC. Yep. You always want to be back to back as much as you can if you're going to go into a reuse situation. Uh, I wouldn't. I'd go 15, but they're going to trick question. We don't have 15. That's right. That's coming. You don't think it's not. That's something I've been wanting. And you two are competing. Right now he's up by two questions, though. Do we have a prize for that? Uh, even if you supported 15, how would you do it on that deployment? Don't you need guard bands with your... Not really. There will be enough support between that and ICIC as long as you do this right and your azimuths are good. You know, I, you know, I cannot stress making sure your azimuths are on point, no pun intended, to uh, avoid that situation. But yes, I'd go 15s, ABC, ABC, front to back uh, configuration. Anybody else while we're on this beautiful flower of a slide? By the way, this gentleman. How many people throw their sectors up without using a compass or some other type of measurement to get your azimuth correct? Probably most of you. Yeah, that looks south. Yeah. Is anybody using contractors to have your stuff put up? Tim, make sure you get an azimuth report. That should be a part of your closeout package. So don't settle for anything less. If you guys are using contractors, I would be asking for full line sweeps, full PIM, full azimuth readings as part of your closeout, and obviously photos. Um, don't accept anything less because you want documentation of everything that was there, including the signal levels before Rick, they hung it. Sounds like another buy tip. You're going to be buy tips for days. All right. All right, so there's some generalities here. Obviously, I'm, I want to go back through this. Um, some of you are probably running 490s now. If you wouldn't mind, put a quick show of hands. Okay, don't feel bad. All right, are you running 20s? You're running 20s? Are you having any issues? Are you, you're one of the fortunate ones. How many customers do you have on that site, if you don't mind me asking? Close to 70, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Right. Good. All right, so one thing that we, you know, I preach a lot is uh, down tilt. If you're really going to have a lot of sights in, be careful. Be careful of the antenna you select. You really want to try to find an antenna that can have a variable electrical down tilt setting. Something that usually has got a screw on it and you can, you know, you turn the screw and it'll change the electrical down tilt configuration. The reason I say that is when you change your mechanical down tilt, you change your front to back ratio. That does have an impact. So if you're going heavy mechanical down tilt, say eight degrees, I had some sites that were 12 degrees. It looks like they're, look like they're pointing at the ground, but they're actually serving a great purpose. Um, it caused me problems because I wasn't accounting for the electrical, the electrical tilt issue. So I, I messed up my front to back ratio, caused myself some self interference, quickly rectified but it made me get up there and go, all right, let's, let's pull that back to maybe four degrees mechanical and we'll go to six degrees electrical, you know, some flavor of that con, um, uh, setup. So something to keep in mind too. So if you're looking at antennas and high quality antennas will have a variable electrical down tilt option. Um, ones that I like that do that today, uh, Alpha, uh, RFS, uh, a couple, I even think Comscope makes a couple uh, that do that as well that have a, essentially it's a, um, Allen wrench that can, you can uh, electrically modify your tilt by zero to seven degrees. RFS has one to go zero to 12 degrees even. Uh, not cheap though, so I'm not gonna lie to you, say they're, they're cheap, they're six to 600 to a thousand bucks a whack, depending on which one you get. Any questions? I have one question. Yes, sir. I just wanna ask the audience, who think we done good by bringing camera in here, into our company? All right, oh, thank you. If you didn't, you can keep your hand down. <laughs> um, I will be available, obviously, during break and lunch. If you have some more direct questions you want to kind of get after me with um, or tell me I'm wrong, I'm fine with that, too. I take criticisms very well. Um, it's, it just come with some good information. Otherwise, be prepared to defend yourself. Yes, sir. We have two 90-degree sectors. Great. I've got them separated 90 degrees, obviously, because I'm not thinking about all this overlap. Where should I be placing that second one at? Pretend they're 120s, separated Pretend by 120, 120 degrees. degrees. All right. yep. Yeah, so that, you know, that's a good thing. So pretend that your 90s are 120s, 
Your 120s are basically 180s because you saw the pattern back there. That's horrible. So you just expanded your coverage 30 more degrees. Yeah, true story. And you're going to get a higher gain anyway. So, um, yeah, so pretend, pretend these are 120s. You see I, I built it as so. And even just so you guys understand how tight the carriers do it, in a carrier deployment, three sectors, they're doing three sectors for 360 degrees using 65 degree antennas, and they get 360 coverage. All right? So keep that in mind. Like, th this does work, and these are 90s. And again, four sectors. So I would, you know, you could, I prefer 465s, and even that pattern, they are very pretty looking because obviously it's for a presentation, but if you see the true pattern, it looks a little bit more realistic. Okay. I just wanted to put this up here. Patrick kind of said take it out. I was like, eh, nah. It's uh, something that's really cool to me. So this is a macro coverage in 2013. This is actual, you know, it's not as cool as the, the light switch thing. This is actual uh, gathered data from all the carriers of what we're looking at for tower sites, essentially, throughout the country. 2016. All right. That's obviously layering some small cells, but you can see the, uh, the data requirements have gotten exponentially huge. Now, if, uh, how many people consider yourself in any urban markets? Only two? That's, that's, that's a wisp if I've ever seen one. All right. Define urban. Uh, oh, by my, <laughs> I live in Maine, so right. urban to that's me is anything I bigger I than 15,000 people. So anything bigger than 15,000 people in your given town, that's an urban deployment. Think of it as such. Um, with, kind of lost my train of thought there going into it, but with a particular urban deployment, you gotta be you know, cognizant of what you're getting into because you know what the capacity is. Right now it's 32 active connections. So it'll be bumping to 64 or 96. You, the, uh, oh, I know where I was getting into. Uh, if you are technologically savvy with APIs, the, there's a really cool function to know where your customers are gonna be. It's Twitter. Twitter has public data, social network that you can download that shows you where the users congregate. It's a really cool tool to take advantage of if you're doing network planning. And maybe that'd be some, some cool tenant Dennis could integrate into his site. So that's something to take in mind. Like use the technology that's out there. If you're very familiar with working with APIs, go get this data. It's free. It's telling you where your customers are going to be if you're ever developing you know, mobility support. And CBRS is really going to be big. You guys all heard LTU is coming, and we all probably cried a little bit knowing the carriers are going to be playing in our wheelhouse again. Um, it's coming. So now let's take it away, let's embrace it, figure out how you can build that network before they do and sell it back to them. Because if you're doing LTE, you're doing a standard. They're ready for a standard. We love standards. Which, standard. oh, by the way, you, do it, you did at Red Zone, right? This is exactly what I did at Red Zone. So had we signed an agreement now uh, with one of the carriers and based on the data throughput calculations, here's a number that's going to grab you a little bit. We would have made $32.3 million last year in roaming at four cents a meg. That's a pretty cool number. Anybody get excited about that? I get a little If you think they're not, you're fooling yourself. They're going to be, they're, they're gonna be playing in CBRS. Yeah, they're going to be Absolutely. playing in five gig. They're going to be doing offload. And this is my favorite product that was announced in Barcelona. Neutral cell. Uh, I'll talk. I'll talk. Don't go there yet. I'm okay. not going to go there yet, but it's cool. I'm very excited. I don't have much cool stuff to talk about today, so uh, that's, a, that's a big one. But, yes, they're going to be playing with that. So if you guys are designing and, and kind of going back to what Jesse talked about with the PLMN IDs, the PLMN IDs is basically a unique number for you. So if you get your own EPC, do you have your own SIMs or you get Intellirad SIMs? Yeah, I can get you a contact. You can make your own. You can burn your own SIM. There's a, I don't know if I put it on here, but Ericsson essentially runs this, there's a website called iConnective, I-C-O-N-N-E-C-T-I-V uh, dot net. That's where you can go and you can become, you get your own PLMN ID. Every carry has their own. But I had my own. You cannot use the cloud if you're doing that. You cannot use the cloud. That's why I, said, I pre preface with your EPC. So mine at Red Zone, for example, is 312780. That's mine. That's my identifier nationally. You have to re-register it every year. It's a couple hundred bucks. No, you know, no big deal. But then you can burn your own SIMs. 
you know, have them made. I had mine customized, had a pretty Red Zone logo on it, things like that, but it works in any device I want. It's my PLMN, I control everything. But when you have your own EPC, particularly one that's mobility enabled, you can allow other PLMN IDs. And I actually graphed, just so I could show my investment group, uh, what I was getting. So I could deny, I could graph all the denies. I had 13,000 devices an hour from Sprint try to attach to my network. I had 8,000 T-Mobile and about 6,000 6, combined between AT&T and Verizon try to attach to my network every minute. And it's just get denied at the core. And I could graph all that so I could take to my investors and say, this is why we need to have a, an agreement with these guys. They want in. They're trying to attach to our network. Let's get them on. Let's start charging them some money. You know, so this is all stuff you can do with your own EPC. There's so much uh, advantages to it. And getting your own PLMN ID would be that step once you get an EPC of your own. But remember, you know, adding your own EPC is something you can do down the road. You don't yep. have to start that way. There's no... No, plan. definitely come in. Like, if, if you're looking to get into LT, you're limping in, you can always migrate your SIMs in. You can have multiple PLMNs. So if we have ours, the, the, when I say ours, buy cells, um, we can take those same SIM cards that are already in the field, we can get you and load it into another EPC, and it'll still work. It's not going to not work. So we have all that functionality available. So how much, how much time do you have? We have a uh, lunch set up at 1230. How much time do you need to, to go? That's essentially it. All Ooh. right. How do you like them apples? Any quick question, guys? Or no, I, nothing's been quick, but I like the questions before we go break for lunch. I thought and we were going to do it after lunch. So I wanted you fueled up before we got into this. Cameron, so. I want to make sure you and the, and the gentleman with Gulf Coast, you guys get each other's cards. Yeah, I absolutely. I like we'll be talking a lot to you. Yeah. I'll, be, uh, I'll be out here, guys, in the hall. Yes, sir. That one? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, heavily wooded areas? Uh, I wouldn't say they necessarily help. So what you're doing is you create less cell edge issues, but you're only going to lose, you know, when you're at 90 degrees, depending if you have a 3 dB roll off antenna, you know, you get at 120s, you're going to roll off 3 dB. So you're losing 3 dB. There, there are always a trade off uh, by tightening your PEMS. You may lose some coverage. Very unlikely though. I mean, it's, it's quite unlikely that you're going to lose some coverage. Um, respect to what you would have picked up in interference. So you keep that in mind. So you may have coverage from an RSSI standpoint, but your CINR may just go right in the toilet if you're overlapping too much. Yes, sir. Armando, right there as well. He's what is the uh, recommended height to have the, dev the devices at? The recommended height? Yeah. Well, the default answer, probably by most people's room, as high as you can get it. But, I mean, right. like, um, it's going to depend. Like in a small cell environment, you're going to be deploying probably less than 50 feet. You know? It depends if you're where Tim is, or Tim has a pile of trees that are 3,000 feet tall. I'd want to be under the canopy and shoot through the trunks instead. I wouldn't want to be up in the correct. canopy. I mean, I'm, every, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not going to, I can't recommend one I'm, to you. I'm in Louisiana, and one of the problems we have is obviously trees and yeah. vegetation and stuff like that. And uh, I just started, uh, I just deployed one to start testing it, and I can't get more than. Two, two, uh, two and a half miles, maybe. I, the, I would say, depending on the scenario, I'm not going to be entirely surprised. There's been times where I've deployed band 41 at 10 watts, and I couldn't get three miles. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to run in, you're going to run into those situations from time to time. This is not a damn thing you can do about it other than just try to find another site to put it at. So there's, there's no one size fits all. You know, that's kind of the reasons, like, when I use my Atoll software, uh, which is what I, what I use, um, it has features such as the, you know, auto PCI planning, auto frequency selection and also can do, like if you're doing a complete green field deployment, it'll do auto site selection. So you can import a database of tower sites available or you can say, I'm gonna do raw construction and it'll just go and say, if you want coverage everywhere, you wanna meet these metrics, this is where you put your sites. Dennis, I think you guys might even wanna think about uh, that as a service, get some of that software, are you? He's, a, I think he's been over there thumbing away the whole time. So. All right. <laughs> Do antenna arrays have to be completely symmetric? They don't have to be. There's many instances where, like, if you're not deploying, you know, if, like, I had a lot of islands in the coast of Maine. Yeah. Not, not a shocker there. I didn't really have a need to point any antennas towards Italy. So I just put a couple up facing back towards the coast. So, no, you don't have to be completely symmetric. 
I would, like if you're, if you're trying to cover 360, try to be. Otherwise, you can create some headaches for yourself. A follow-up question, I like it. So it, what, what I meant was, like, can you put one antenna that covers 90 degrees on the back and maybe four at, at 60 each on the front or something like that? I see where you're going. So I'm going to say yes, but let's talk about it. All right? I, I know what you're trying to accomplish because you may have one area that's got maybe 10 customers on the back side. You don't need to put a bunch of E-Node Bs up. So let's put one up to cover that area. And yeah, the other side is like, you know, 50,000 people you need to cover as many as you can get away with. So can I put three or four that way? Short answer is yes, but it requires planning. Planning, planning, planning. You cannot put enough time into it. I, I, I would not lie to you guys. Put time into your RF and PCI planning. Get, so, it, get it right. The, so at